Logan Paul. A name where, upon hearing it, only the worst memories imaginable come to mind. I think there's someone hanging right there. I made a severe and continuous lapse in my judgment. See, Logan does not have the greatest track record. He's pretty much consistently been terrible. But you know what? He actually did do something good for once. He blessed us with some absolutely horrible movies. I mean, just downright awful writing and offensively bad acting. His movies are like a collection of perfectly curated awfulness. <laughs> We're going to look into his mostly already forgotten, laughably bad film career, and do a full analysis on the many movies he's been involved in and what each of these say about him. And since his film career seems to be pretty much over as he's not really still dabbling in projects like this anymore, we can look back at this as complete for now. He's been the main director and creator of a movie, He's been the main screenwriter, and many times over he's been an actor, specifically lead actor. We're going to be looking over some of his most notable projects, such as The Thinning Movies, a generic, messy, poorly written dystopian series, definitely just made to cash in on the hype of The Hunger Games, where Logan plays the main character who's a high schooler. There's also Airplane Mode, a comedy that's just, uh, washed up influencers on an airplane flying out to a convention called Hashtagacon. What convention? You didn't hear about Hashtagacon? Bro, it's the biggest social media convention ever. I think this catastrophic event has to be the second worst day in history for aviation. He also has a mockumentary on Flat Earthers. So there's quite a diversity in the genres of films he's done, and none of them are good. So I hope you're prepared for what we're about to get into because it's a lot. Brace yourself. We're gonna start this off by looking at the Thinning series, but first before we get into that, this video genuinely would not have been made possible if not for Honkai Impact 3rd, today's sponsor. Honkai Impact 3rd is an incredibly fun, free-to-play game. It's a next-gen 3D cross-platform anime action game that can be played on iOS, Android, PC, Steam, and Epic. The game features open-world exploration, immersive stories, and beautiful 3D effects. And there's a plethora of ways to play this game. You can play mini-games, full-scale expansions, or just have fun exploring the open world. You can also fight alongside Valkyries and team up with other players to solve puzzles and beat bosses. If you like story in the games you play, this one is definitely for you as Honkai Impact 3rd's stories have beautiful cinematics and phenomenal voice acting. Right now, Honkai Impact 3rd has just finished up version 6.7, version 6.8 is starting up now, and things are about to get good. The story is about to heat up with so many more twists and turns coming in, with the story now going into chapter 38. For gameplay, there are many new things players can look forward to with this new version. Starting with the new s rank battle suit, Sila's Hersher of Rebirth. She's a psychic physical type damage dealer whose combat has her fighting side by side with summons. She has two forms, Soul Shaper and Life Binder. Honkai Impact 3rd has also introduced a new elf called Project Bunny. There are also three new character outfits to get excited about, Darkbolt Jonin's Shimmering Wavelets, Mist Elm's first new outfit, Silky Violet Dream, and Starlet Astrologo's Star Told Fortune. Coming online in 6.8 is the new limited time main story mode event, Chasing Light, Drinking Shadow, where players will be able to collect moon rocks in exchange for many different rewards, such as four star event Stigma Mist Elm, Dressing, Crystals, Ancient Willpower, Time Swirl Pass, and more. In addition to the main story mode event, Honkai Impact 3rd is also rolling out its first summer themed event, Before the Endless Dream Ends. Playing through the event and clearing stages will let you exchange for Darkbolt Jonin's new outfit, crystals, Honkai shards, and more. Also, after clearing a certain number of stages, you can obtain an event emblem. The main objective of the event is to defeat enemies by using different cards. When a battle begins, you'll receive random cards with varying skill effects, to which you'll then have to arrange your formation by dragging cards into the right positions. You can merge cards of the same star level to upgrade them to more powerful ones. You can also exchange unwanted cards for new ones by dragging them to the bottom right corner. During turn-based battles, deployed characters will follow the order of the card sequence and engage in auto battle to cast their skills. So it's a very engaging event that really tests your strategizing abilities. To further that, this event also introduces multiple battle factions, each one with its own distinct strategies, with characters and cards best suited to it. So it's a very fun, fresh new event. Honkai Impact 3rd's Physical Prize of the Year is also coming. 
Our collection volume 2, The Moon's Origin and Finality, is also released in 6.8. Players over level 81 can get this by completing the Hot Summer Gift and Book of Memories event missions. Also, Hoyoverse is coming to Gamescom. From August 23rd to August 27th, multiple games of Hoyoverse will be there, including Honkai Impact 3rd, where you can experience booth events and stage events such as band performances, stage challenges, and lucky pulls. At the Honkai Impact 3rd booth, you can follow these steps to receive items. At Gamescom, you'll also get access to a whole ton of Honkai Impact 3rd merch. There are over 30 types of merch available, and you get the chance to receive a freebie when you spend a certain amount, while supplies last. Now is the best time to start playing the game, and if all of this sounds of interest to you, you can download Honkai Impact 3rd now using my link in the description, and use the redeem code REBIRTH to get tons of rewards. New players will have even more bonuses in-game to explore. Thank you Honkai Impact 3rd for making this video possible. Now onto the disaster of Logan Paul's film career. More specifically, The Thinning. The greatest dystopian YA film series that puts The Hunger Games and everything else to shame. No, I mean, The Thinning series is definitely something to behold. It's, it's like if you took the worst, most overdone cliches from that mid-2010s dystopian era and then garnished it with a heavy sprinkling of Logan Paul on top. It's nasty. Uh, nasty synonyms. Um, appallingly, atrociously, malodorously, atrocious. Yeah, by the way, this movie was made by the same guy who made the Smile movie with Shane Dawson. And to make the long story short, it also sucked. <laughs> Everyone hated it. This guy just really likes making awful YouTuber films. I mean, someone's gotta do it, I guess. Now, in the Thinning series, there's two movies. The Thinning, and then the second movie, The Thinning New World Order. So let's start out with the briefest summary possible of The Thinning One. It takes place in the very near future in the USA. The world's resources have been dwindling fast, so the countries of the world banded together and said, hey, let's just get rid of some people. So each year, every country has to delete 5% of their population. And the method they use for selecting which 5% to get rid of is subject to whatever each country wants to do. The USA wanted to delete the dumbest 5% of people. So each year from the time kids enter school to when they graduate, they have to take a test annually and the bottom performing students of each class get eliminated. <laughs> Logan Paul plays a high school student, Blake Redding, but I mean, this is not a different character, this is just Logan Paul. I mean, look at him. So, instead of referring to him by his character's name, for this video, I'm just gonna refer to him as Logan. No matter who Logan is supposed to be playing on screen, you never get the sense that this is some different character. He doesn't transform himself or make you think he's someone with a different backstory. This is just... He, it's just him. So the movie starts out with Logan and his girlfriend, Ellie. They're having a blast. Having a pool party late at night, a rendezvous. The night before the thinning test. You know, the test that will delete one of them if they answer questions wrong. So this is just a brilliant use of their time, really. Listen, if it were me, if my life was dependent on my ability to answer math questions in the morning, well, I'd simply die. <laughs> There'd be no chance for me. No hope. But I mean, I'd at least try not to. I'd try to prepare myself for the test and not do whatever this is. Logan goes home and his dad is not happy. He's this big scary Texas governor. He has a talk with Logan telling him he can't let a girl be a distraction because no son of the governor is going to be failing this test. So the day of the thinning arrives, his girlfriend fails the test. Because again, with the night they had, I don't know how anybody could have expected anything different. So she gets thinned. Bye. Good riddance. And Logan Paul has a very Logan Paul performance here. He's far from great when it comes to acting, but if there's one thing this man can do, it's yell. He can be very loud. Let him go! No, let him go! Ali, Ali. If you put a camera in front of him and tell him to go ballistic, he'll do it. Turns out Logan isn't acting. It's just the beast inside of him wanting to be free. A year passes after the last thinning and Logan is still sad about his girlfriend and it's time for him to take the test again. And at this point, he really hates his dad. See, as previously stated, his dad's a governor. His whole political campaign is actually about how the thinning is great. You know, getting rid of children is phenomenal. I think we should up our numbers. Line goes up. Are we deleting enough? He could not love this more. So Logan obviously hates his dad for this and he makes a plan to purposefully fail the test 
and become a martyr and have his dad deal with that stain on his reputation. He goes to school, throws the test, and instead of him getting pulled, another girl does, Lena. Lena is actually an important character in this movie. She's had a few scenes, I don't think we need to go into them too much, but all you need to know is she's smart, a top student, and she's been selling cheating contact lenses to kids before their tests to get some money, so that way she can pay for her badly ill mother's medical treatment. So she's a top student, she didn't actually fail this test. The governor got news that Logan's test result was a fail, so he got a guy to swap their pass and fail results. Also, this is the time for me to mention before I forget, this whole movie just looks like an anti-bullying commercial. Or not commercial, PSA. The filter and visual look of those things, this matches it to a T. The governor gives a speech to a horrible stock footage audience and declares he's running for president. Lena and the other students are taken into the underground thinning rooms and tunnels at the school where they're going to get deleted. Logan starts whimpering around in the halls and then takes out a guard with a plan to go do something to help Lena. Sir. And at this point in the movie, you see the most comically blatant attempt to try to say, Hey, these bad guys are bad. You know, the evil people are evil. See, they're, they're, in, they're in dark, scary red lighting. These guys are, are bad news. This whole thing that this movie is doing is completely unnecessary and shows a lack of trust in the audience. Logan finds Lena and they try to escape the school. The two of them end up crawling through a vent and Logan falls out of it into a pool directly below. It's not supposed to be funny. <laughs> um, it's not supposed to be funny. Like, this movie takes itself so seriously, but these shots, I, <laughs> I cannot. <laughs> So now's a good time to touch on Logan Paul's acting in the film because at this rate I'm convinced they just stuck him under the water here not doing anything so he wouldn't have to act because his acting is definitely not great. It's pretty bad. You're always aware he's acting. He's never really feeling what he's saying. You're watching a guy go through what he's supposed to say but he's not actually embodying it. When it comes to dialogue with a neutral tone or subtle sadness, disappointment, stirring anger, just more so muted emotions that convey complexity, he's terrible. Like his line delivery is god awful. They took Ellie. She's going to the thinning. We have, we have to do something, Dad. Just make a phone call. You can say it was a mistake. You know, when Logan needs to yell angrily though, or he needs to like thrash around or exhibit a strong emotion, it's a little bit less bad. Which checks out, honestly. Every other actor in this film does a better job than him. I don't know, they seem more convincing. Aside from his very disappointing acting, his other contributions to the movie are being shirtless a god-awful amount of times, and again, the pool scene where he just sits there. After Logan falls into the pool, Lena dives in and saves him. They split up, and Logan gets caught by a guard. Lena continues on her way to find some control room that has all the test scores on a database. She extracts the data showing she got a 98% and was marked as a fail, while Logan's character only got 15% and passed. So she sent all this information to her friend, and then her friend sent this information to every news network. And this being released put pressure on the governor because everybody saw he did something corrupt, so then he lets Lena go. But Logan gets banished to the Shadow Realm. He is thinned. But then, the movie ends on a cliffhanger where, somehow, he's alive. And so is Ellie, his girlfriend who died earlier in the movie. It's a pretty poor movie, but we still have more to go through because there's the sequel. The Thinning New World Order. The second movie picks up right after the cliffhanger of the first one. Logan and the other Thin students wake up in some room in an underground factory. They're given a briefing video that basically says, You weren't too dumb to be completely useless to society, so instead of getting rid of you, we're gonna make you work 14 hours a day to make smartphones or something. They're told that they're the chosen ones, and if someone individually proves themselves to be a hard enough worker, they can be reintegrated back into society. It's called the Incubator Program. While this is going on, Lena is being bribed by the governor's team to become a political advocate for the thinning and denounce that any corruption took place. They basically tell her that her sibling's safety depends on what she chooses. So Logan finds his girlfriend at the Incubator Program, and it takes him like 10 seconds before his shirt is off. 
you know, it really didn't take long in this movie for this to happen. Logan's governor dad is still running for president, and now a woman is running against him who is campaigning to end the thinnings. Randomly, the governor's advisors tell him, Sir, you need to get used to debating a woman. Which causes Lena to volunteer as tribute and have her release of pent-up anger, Mary Sue character moment. To get used to debating a woman. I can do it. I'll debate you. We're looking for someone a little more qualified. The thinning is a barbaric program that blames students for the failures of a broken education system. But it sure makes it easier to put the blame on students than having to look higher on the totem pole. But the way this scene came about was in such a contrived, inorganic way. Saying, oh no, you, you need to get used to debating a woman, but we have no woman here. Oh wait, we do. Here's Elena's time to shine. Like, what? So, it's a very odd moment. Lena's friend from the first movie is now into journalism and he did some digging. He found out that the company that makes the thinning serum is outsourcing work while insourcing food rations and he concludes that they're using failed students to make tablets and stuff. After finding this information, he gets plastic bagged in his car. Somehow he lives, so he goes to Lena with proof that this is happening. He goes up to his car and he gets kaboomed. He's gone. Which just makes you wonder, why didn't they just take him out the first time? You know, it feels pointless. Now, throughout the movie, Lena's story has been overly complicated for no reason, and I tried keeping it straightforward for this video, but I left out a lot. The long and short of it, though, is that she made a connection with a woman who said she'd be on her side and help her expose corruption or whatever. And this lady, towards the end, turns out to be incredibly untrustworthy as she tries to make Lena jump off a building. Then, after a crappy action sequence, Lena kicks her down the stairs, where she tumbles to her demise. It's pretty anticlimactic. I mean, you had her armed, telling Lena she has to jump off the roof. You have a chase sequence, but then you end it like this? Like, the most mediocre, I've fallen and I can't get up, cinema death? <laughs> like, um, I don't know. The Texas governor wins the election, and in the most cringe sequence to ever exist, his administration says, We can't break the law, because now we are the law. It's extremely illegal. Not anymore. We can't break the law, because now we are the law. And they decide to delete everybody who opposed the thinning. Which just obviously isn't how any of this works, because based on what's been shown politically in the film, the USA still has a democracy that functions relatively the same as it does now. The president doesn't just get to instantly act on something because they feel like it. If that were the case, there wouldn't have even been an election in the first place in this movie because the person who previously held power wouldn't have given it up. They would have just changed the law to hold on to it. You know, so a decision to delete anyone who opposed you politically with nothing stopping you just isn't even plausible. The world building in this movie is horrible, and it's not even consistent with politics. Logan and Ellie break out of the underground factory after starting an uprising. They get to the surface and are immediately arrested. Then some guy breaks them out, and then the movie very abruptly ends. And I mean very abruptly. The movie just ends on a cliffhanger. We're going to war. And what's funny about this cliffhanger is that there's no third movie. So that's just the end of this series. It's the perfect ending it deserved. So I went to check out the movies on Letterboxd, and they somehow have a combined total of nine fans, which is nine fans too much. Now, I'd like to touch on the doo-doo world building. Now, with the concept of weeding out 5% of the population, there's a huge world building issue here. So it, it does not make sense to get rid of 5% of the world's population if you're going at this from an angle of resource management. As we know, the number one consumer of resources on Earth are corporations. Your individual footprint does not matter as much as one giant company. Removing 400 million people will not stop their resource consumption problem because these corporations in place won't really slow down their processes. A bunch of the people eliminated each year also fit into age categories that make them a customer of no one because either they're too old to live independently or they're too young to have financial independence. Each company would only suffer a very tiny loss of their customers. It's not a large enough amount to stop corporation output. So for the world to band together and say, hey, we need to erase 400 million people a year to stop resource consumption 
doesn't make sense because it would be far more effective to take out corporations or place limitations on their resource consumption. So really this concept is just dumb. Oh also, another funny thing about this movie is that when they're being assigned positions in the factory, everyone's IQ flashes on a screen. And I assume the filmmaker values the IQ system, or at least suggests that this society lives by it, since they have everybody's IQ on record. Now let's just sit here with this information for a second. If the goal of the US in this movie is to keep only the brightest students alive, and they have a literal IQ attached to everybody's ID, then you can assume they greatly value the measurement of IQ as a strong indicator for how smart someone is. And based on the IQ system, with the numbers that I'm seeing above these students, they really decided to thin out people who were incredibly intelligent or borderline geniuses. Which just feels like a world building problem again. Also fun to note, Logan's character has the lowest IQ out of anyone we see. Now Logan Paul just starred in this movie, he didn't direct it, it is posted to his YouTube channel. But this next movie we're gonna look into is truly Logan Paul's movie. The one he starred in as the main character again, and also co-wrote as one of the main writers. And this one is just, it's, it's something else. Prepare yourself for airplane mode. Airplane mode might be the worst thing your soul could ever witness. It is a time capsule, a time capsule from hell on the worst point in influencer history. This movie is all about a bunch of YouTubers and ultimately ex-Vine stars going on a plane to go to the convention, Hashtagacon. What convention? You didn't hear about Hashtagacon? Bro, it's the biggest social media convention ever. You. The film starts out with an animated sequence that looks like an airplane safety video, which is graphically interesting. You know, it's visually executed well, but it's a lot. To quote the notes I took while watching, Dog dies of fart, someone pukes, selfie sticks will be provided mandatorily. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of super aged, outdated humor right out of the gate. Holy bridges lips can be used as a flotation device. If you do not have a selfie stick, one will be provided for you. And anything that didn't fit into that category was just lazy or jokes that were written for shock value. Just trying to use shock factor alone to get laughs, so they don't need to really put any actual work in and write a clever joke. After this part ends, the movie cuts to Logan Paul's room. In this movie, he's playing himself, as is every other influencer. Now, the opening scene may have been unfunny, but it opened visually interesting, and now that went away, so all that's left is this film quality. And I think it looks like a detergent commercial, a vacuum commercial, a fabric spray commercial. You get it, it's so overly lit, and the set is so artificial looking that you get scenes that look like a set for advertising a cleaning item. The main part of the movie here starts off with Logan Paul chatting with his online Australian girlfriend. And while chatting, they're doing the most, you know, obscene activities possible, with Lele Pons catching and filming him. They have a fight, and shortly after this, every possible terrible influencer from 2014 appears, just crawling out of places in his room. Everyone's in the room. Avengers from hell. Avengers from the shadow dimension. And it quickly becomes apparent that comedy in this movie is just these guys jumping around and yelling a lot. Loud equal funny. Stop, 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 stop. stop. <laughs> Taking up space and acting like this was their cling to relevancy. This is just all they knew to do. And I'll admit, when I was 11 years old, I unfortunately did find this humor funny. I would look at Lele Pons throwing herself off a bridge or just flopping around in general and think, my god, this is, this is fine cuisine. This is um, escargot, caviar, prestigious dining option of online content. This is it. Uh, it, it was not. Anyway, while they're jumping around, they decide to all book a trip to hashtag a con. One problem, Logan is terrified of flying. Because when he was a kid, he jumped out of a tree thinking he could fly, but he broke both of his femurs. So he doesn't want to go on the trip, but eventually he's convinced because hashtag a con is in Australia, and so is his girlfriend. So if he goes, he'll get to see her. Side note, Jake Paul is not in this movie. Logan instead has a foreign exchange brother replacing him. And the reason for not having Jake around is because Disney got him. What about your real brother? Disney got him. Everyone arrives at the airport and they go through security. 
When they get to the plane, everybody has to try to force Logan on board, and he once again demonstrates his phenomenal talent of not being able to act, but just thrashing around. <laughs> Lele Pons misses the flight and she falls on her face, as she does. Ladies and gentlemen, crustaceans, Lele Pons, the only influencer to build her career on flopping. When on the flight, Logan is asked if he can assist the flight crew in case of an emergency since he's at an exit seat, and he responds to this completely normal question like this. Hero, are you willing and capable to assist in the event of an emergency? No! No! Not! It's a really awkward moment, and the movie's littered with these because I think it was supposed to be funny, but I don't know, he didn't really sell the delivery, and it's just, it's really out of place. <laughs> But once again, he can raise his voice. That is something he can do. On the plane, you see a lot of influencers amidst the background actors, but one that is super important to mention here, I think, is Curtis Lepore. An absolute jump scare seeing him here. I feel like Lepore has mostly been forgotten by a lot of people. He was really popular on Vine, and since then he's faded into, you know, no one really even knowing who he is. But if you want to know more, here's the rundown. There were some pretty serious allegations against him for aggressive behavior with his ex-girlfriend. And in court, he ended up pleading guilty. So you know, past allegations at that point, and we're, we're at full-blown, flat-out conviction. This situation happened in 2014. Airplane Mode began filming in 2016. So sit with that information as you will. On the plane, everyone starts partying and being self-obsessed influencers. You know, no one had to get into character. <laughs> they just turned the camera on. And because they didn't put their phones on airplane mode, the pilots die. So now the plane is in an emergency situation because no one's flying it. Most of the movie takes place with them on the plane and lots of little things happen here and there, but we're just gonna focus on the bigger details. Logan forms a bond with the girl he's seated beside. There's lots of accenting characters on the plane who have speaking roles as well, and they outshine the influencers easily. Like, they're infinitely more convincing, and their line delivery is better. Though, the jokes they tell, you know, the writing in this movie is still bad, but you could tell they were really trying to work with what they were given. So, with the plot, Vitaly decides to take the plane hostage, and he just starts getting rid of some people. Eventually, Logan saves the day by getting rid of Vitaly and safely landing the plane. Once they land, there's not really much further mention of hashtag con. You, you don't even get to see it. It's completely forgotten. The movie ends by Logan meeting up with the girl he bonded with on the plane instead of his girlfriend in Australia. There's so much I glossed over, but I mean, what you really need to know is that the movie is just Logan Paul and others being cringe. And it's a time capsule of just the worst things this era of time produced. I mean, the worst. <laughs> Uh, what convention? You didn't hear about hashtag -a Bro, it's the biggest social media convention ever. Yeah, man, hashtag -a If you do not have a selfie stick, one will be provided for you. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I will say, though, is that the painful thing about this movie is that there were spots that were actually a little funny. Problem is, these little crumbs of potential are sandwiched between giant mountains of garbage. Up close, small details can be all right. But when you take a step back and look at the bigger picture that they all piece together and create, it's just horrible. And thing is, I find this exact problem is one that Logan Paul has repeated time and time again. Especially in his next movie we talk about, Flat Earth to the Edge and Back. Flat Earth to the Edge and Back is Logan's mockumentary film where he pretends to be a flat earther and infiltrates the Flat Earth convention searching for the truth. And I'll say it outright, it's a great concept. I mean, it's phenomenal, like, it's a phenomenal concept. I think we need more people infiltrating the Flat Earth Society, actually. It's a really solid idea. But while this concept may have been great, the way Logan executed it was pretty poor. And this movie of his, the problem isn't that it's cringy or laughably bad. It more so just shows that he's not a good filmmaker. It's not his forte. He's not great at telling a story and committing to the narrative. And listen, I, I know it's a mockumentary. I'm not trying to grade him like he's Christopher Nolan. Like, like this is not Oppenheimer. However, Logan did call this project a movie. He made a script for it, casted people, and treated it as such. He even had a post-movie FAQ sort of thing. So he took this project seriously enough to call it a movie. 
A lot of people actually did like the film and said it saved his reputation. They praised it saying it was a good mockumentary, but in my opinion, it is very mid. It does not feel like a movie, it's a YouTube video, but Logan gave this thing movie treatment. He labeled it as such. So for the sake of this video, because he counted as that, I'm gonna have to count it as that as well and put it in as part of his film career. The plot of the movie summed up real quick is this. Logan's friend comes out as a flat earther. Logan starts questioning his reality, wondering, is the earth really flat? So he goes and interviews some kids, but then decides to go to the Flat Earth convention. He interviews real Flat Earthers there, and he meets a girl, falls in love with her, and starts talking about having a life with her. At the convention, he then comes out of the Flat Earth closet. I think I'm coming out of the Flat Earth closet. After he comes back from the convention, his friend who said he was a Flat Earther says he was joking the whole time and doesn't actually believe in that. Logan rages, and then the movie ends. So, the movie was split between fiction and non-fiction, acting versus real people. Most of the movie is acting. Logan is acting, his friends are acting, and the flat earther girl he falls in love with is also an actress. So let's go through the problems it had. Problem number one, the editing is dookie. This can be seen all over the place, you don't have to look hard. But specific examples would be how these subtitles are positioned during the security camera footage scene, how terrible the audio balancing is at certain parts where people are speaking, like you can't even hear them properly over music, and another editing problem is the censorship of flat earthers' faces. There's a flat earther whose face censorship slips and you can see her. I mean, it's facts. Like, I can think of myself. I'm almost 15. I almost don't care about the adult flat earthers' faces being out there because it's a public environment, they're adults, they can be held accountable for their actions. But when she's so young that she obviously couldn't have driven herself, who brought her, right? With flat earth children, you can't fully put that blame on them. Them believing in the flat earth when they're so young, it comes down to their parents at home. Like the parents are bringing them to these conventions and putting these beliefs on them. So I really don't think their faces should be out there because it just makes them a target. Moral implications aside though, the sensor slipping just shows the lack of care the editing got. Before you come at me, my editing is not, <laughs> um, is not phenomenal, but I'm not calling my videos movies. Problem number two, there's hardly enough actual flat earthers in this mockumentary. The movie is 50 minutes long and you don't get to the flat earth convention until 20 minutes in. And then at the 31 minute mark, he takes a break from that to go on an acted out date with the girl. He returns briefly to the convention setting around 35 minutes, and then he goes back to acting at 36 minutes. He does a final return to the non-acting portion at 40 minutes, and this lasts two minutes. Then the rest of the movie is acting and a montage of the internet's reaction to him. So out of the 50 minutes, only about 15 of it is solid actual flat earther content. The movie becomes far less about flat earthers and is really just focused on Logan Paul. The acting in it was really bad from most involved, except the girl he dated was a little convincing. But really with this movie, I think what it comes down to is just wasted potential, right? Because he went to a flat earther convention and somehow decided to only roll with 15 minutes of footage. I mean, how does that happen? This place has got to be a gold mine for content. I would rather see the majority of it be taken up by flat earthers as opposed to Logan Paul. Also in the movie, Logan is unsure whether or not he wants to play someone who believes the earth is flat or play someone who's skeptical. Leading up to the convention while he's talking to his friends, he's acting like he's going through this awakening experience where he's starting to question everything around him and starting to become a flat earther, a believer. Seemed pretty legit. The child had a good point. This was slowly becoming a puzzle that not even I, the all-knowing and error-free Logan Paul, could solve. But then once he gets to the Flat Earth Convention, sometimes he acts like more of a skeptic than a believer. I'm still skeptical. At least you're opening up, though, at least. I wouldn't say that. So we don't even have a real picture of the globe. So I don't have a picture of my intestines, but I know they exist. Even though prior to this, he was acting like a believer, not a skeptic. So overall, he's just sloppy and all over the place. As an average YouTube video, this kind of production is completely fine. It is, like, it just gets really funny when you see he's called it the official movie and treated it like it was one. We've talked about the key movies involving Logan Paul, but right now I'd like to just briefly touch on the fact that he has acted and been involved in more projects. Not a movie, but he has acted in Law & Order, been the main antagonist in a whole episode. He also has been in King Box movie, Where's the Money? And I've heard that it was, um, 
a pretty terrible movie too. Logan also has a casting credit in Baywatch, which is a pretty big movie. But what's funny is that the singular scene he's in got deleted. So his only credit in this is a deleted scene. The smartest move the director could make, honestly. Now this has been our overly deep dive into Logan Paul's film career, years after it's seemingly wrapped up. We've looked through projects that he's fully created, projects he's been a key writer in, and projects he's just starred in with an acting role. And the conclusion is, he is deeply incompetent in all of those fields. And since all of his projects flopped, this must have made him want to move on to more noble things. Like scamming people with CryptoZoo. <laughs> and still not rectifying that mistake months after. Though his movies were pretty dooky, they were fun to make fun of, and they didn't financially ruin people. They didn't scam people out of money. They were just laughably bad. So I kind of want that era of Logan Paul back. But yeah, thank you for sticking around to the end. If you like what you see here, you can always stick around on the channel, leave a like or subscribe. If you want to see more from me, I also have social media, a second channel, and some merch. Thank you for watching, and have a great rest of your day.